pleasure to welcome you all to Magdalen on behalf of the Master and the Fellowship here at Magdalen. Some of you, I hope all of you, will know that we were the college of um, Anthony Edgar Garside Wright. Of course, many of you will know him as Anthony Gray. And he was here a long time ago when things were very different at Magdalen. Indeed, you may not know that Magdalen was in fact the last college in Cambridge and Oxford to become co-ed. But I think one of the beautiful things about Magdalen is that we are an immensely close community that live and work together. And I think people feel able to express who they are within the community here at college. One of the most powerful um, occasions for me was when one of our alumni, a young man who came up in 2001, so not, not that long ago, he was a rower, he was a very athletic guy, he had been at school, and he came to Morden as a very unhappy person because he had never felt able to express his sexuality at school. It simply wasn't an environment that gave him the confidence to be who he was. When he was here, and he was here for four years, and he became captain of boats, which if you know Cambridge is a pretty big deal, he decided to use that period to come out because he felt it was enormously important to make that connection that you could be an immensely sporting chap from an old school and you could come out and be proud of who you were. And he told me this story in San Francisco, where he now lives. He's enormously successful. He's been incredibly good to this college. He's given a lot of money for the support of young people. He has given money to fund counseling here for people who have difficulties, um, be they academic, be they in expressing who they are, be they in finding their niche. And I just wanted to relate that story to you because I think it illustrates beautifully that if you are part of a community that's open, that's warm, that's comfortable, it allows you to become who you are. And I think a lot of our students who come to Cambridge, who come to college, they also grow as people. And I think it's something we're very proud of here at Magdalen. And I think our students are proud of it and the fellowship certainly is. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here for the occasion of the inaugural Anthony Gray Memorial Lecture Thank you very much, Corinne. I'll just test my phone's working. We, we were given the option of lapel microphones, but then the, uh, the, the technician told us a story that somebody had been wearing their lapel microphone and wandered into the toilets while the microphone was still on, so I thought we would avoid uh, <coughs> that mistake for this evening. Um, so I'm Jeremy Clark. I'm the, uh, one of the trustees at the Albany Trust. Uh, and have been there uh, long enough to have known uh, Anthony Gray, although I didn't, in fact, overlap with Anthony's time when Anthony was running the, the Albany Trust, really, in the uh, 60s and the 70s. Uh, but I'm delighted that we've got some of Anthony's friends here today, uh, uh, especially pleased that uh, Andrew has, has been able to, to make it representing Anthony. Uh, and as well as thanking Maudlin, uh, for hosting this. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Alex from Magdalen, who's been incredibly helpful, uh, who's studying medicine here, and who we had the good fortune to meet at an event that, in fact, Andrew organized uh, to commemorate the uh, 1967, 50th anniversary of the 1967 Act. So this uh, inaugural lecture is, is commemorating the 60th anniversary of Albany Trust, um, and I thought I would just try to set the scene by imagining what it must have been like um, 60 years ago and, and indeed what it must have been like uh, even before that when Anthony was at Morgan College himself, um, uh, just after the war. Um, uh, a very different climate uh, and a climate that was getting uh, significantly more dangerous for anybody who was homosexual 
that time, since police arrests had increased tenfold in the two decades uh, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and there was a particular sort of paranoia, as it were, both in America and in this country, um, uh, after the Second World War, about the threat that homosexuality represented in the famous case of the Cambridge Apostles, the Cambridge Spies, uh, and homosexuality being linked with that. So that when the problem of homosexuality, which was twinned uh, in the government's eyes at that time, along with the problem of prostitution, uh, was, was felt there needed to be some, uh, some policy solution, some different uh, kind of solution to this growing problem of, of homosexuality. They gave the job to uh, John Wolfenden. Um, and uh, it was really Wolfenden's inquiry in the Wolfenden report that was the launch pad then for Tony Dyson, who was also at Cambridge, at Pembroke, um, and Anthony, who was a contemporary of Tony Dyson's, to uh, form the Albany Trust with a group of trustees who all themselves had a connection to Cambridge. But just to give you a brief flavor of, of the kind of uh, situation, uh, very different from, from the one we're going to be talking about today, uh, uh, about uh, religious uh, relationship and sexual education in schools. Um, the, the subject of homosexuality couldn't even be named um, in the reports of the Wolfenden Inquiry. They, they referred to homosexuality and prostitution as Huntley and Palmer's in the report, so that the secretaries wouldn't have to uh, uh, be kind of shocked somehow by the discussion of these subjects. And when John Wolfenden, who was felt to be a safe pair of hands in, in carrying out this committee, um, unbeknownst to the people who appointed him, actually had a son who was gay, um, and, and Jeremy Wolfenden. And Jeremy wrote afterwards that his father, when he took the job, um, wrote to him saying, I have only two requests to make of you at the moment. One, that we stay out of each other's way for the time being. Two, that you wear rather less makeup. <laughs> uh, in, in order for his credibility and the credibility of the inquiry not to be affected by, by the behavior of the son of Jeremy. So hopefully we're in uh, uh, a different era, we're in a different climate, uh, but with still some issues to uh, discuss and debate this evening on a subject that I think is uh, very interesting and very important for uh, uh, the LGBT community. Um, I'm absolutely delighted we've got a panel of uh, fantastic speakers um, uh, <coughs> where we, uh, we've got Professor Colin Diamond who is a professor of education and leadership from the University of Birmingham um, to uh, set the context for us. Uh, we have uh, the amazing Peter Tetchell who really needs no introduction um, uh, to deliver this inaugural lecture. Uh, we're very honored that Peter's agreed to do that. And uh, Sidney from Stonewall who leads the education and schools work in Stonewall to give a response to, to Peter's lecture afterwards. And hopefully, if I can get people to stick to time, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion with yourselves at the, at the end of the finish. So, uh, with going on, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Colin Diamond to talk yeah. to us. Thanks very much. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm trying to think what's my Cambridge connection. The nearest I could get would be John Cleaves. <laughs> Remember the film Clockwise, where he's stuck in, you know, in a car, and uh, I had that moment on the M25, and I shouldn't have driven, you know, because I, I thought I wasn't going to get here at all. Anyway, here we are, here we are. Um, I'm here tonight because about a month ago, uh, I wrote a piece very much from the heart for a magazine a trade publication called Schools Week. And my message was why it was absolutely vital 
that the teaching of LGBT awareness continued in Birmingham schools at a time when there were some pretty obnoxious demonstrations going on in the streets, and uh, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a very bad situation. It was setting things back in the years. You know, you talked about the era where we come from. Uh, huge progress had been made in Birmingham in recent years. Suddenly, all of that appeared to be jeopardized. So I'm, I am going to try and set the scene in context. Um, I want to start with a bit of good news. I think we need a bit of national good news at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, um, Parliament seems split down the middle on so many things right now. However, by a magnificent majority of 538 to 21 against, I haven't tracked who the against were, I suspect the probably indeed had something to do with it. Um, they voted through the mandatory uh, introduction of mandatory relation relationships and sex education from the new school year in 2020. So that's relationships and sex education from secondary, a few tiny exceptions, and relationships and education in primary schools. Of course, if you work in primary ed, you work in secondary. Uh, and say, well, what, what, what's new? We've been teaching about these things from one angle or the other for quite, quite a while. But this is the first makeover that the statutory guidance has had since around the year 2000. And of course, many, many things have moved on since, since that time. It's a good debate to read, actually. Um, you get the full spectrum of these opinions coming through. I think it does very much mirror what society is feeling about these issues. On the one hand, have absolutely full, unequivocal support, and for goodness sake, you know, uh, let's remember that uh, 11 year olds, nearly 30% of them, have seen some kind of online porn by that stage. So, you imagine you can withhold this sort of information from them. Um, we also know, in the context of the LGBT community, that way, way north of 50% of LGBT students were bullied at school because of their sexuality. So, come on, time, you know. Um, good debate, really good parliamentary debate. I wish we could say the same about what was happening uh, on the streets of Birmingham. Um, as I touched on a few seconds ago, um, <clears throat> we've seen some ugly scenes out on the streets outside several schools. Um, so the questions I, I have been asked by numerous journalists is, well, what's going on? Uh, why is it? mainly just Birmingham. Uh, who's this guy, Andy Moffat, who wrote the No Outsiders materials? And what on earth should we do next? So roughly in that order. Um, a friend of mine called Andy Moffat wrote some books called Teaching No Outsiders five, six, seven years ago now. Uh, I remember when the book was published. Uh, we got pretty drunk that night. Uh, yeah. A good head teacher meeting, I would say. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. We celebrated the publication of the books. They're a major step forward. Andy had written uh, materials a few years before that, which which were kind of described as challenging homophobia in primary schools. And that ran for a while. Andy wasn't quite happy with the way it was going. So he thought, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to anchor LGBT awareness, teaching thereof, all of that within the Equalities Act 2010, uh, recognizing it along with all the other protected characteristics. And that's the platform upon which we're going to work in, in Birmingham schools. I thought it was really, really good material. It's really good. I remember sitting with councillors of all faiths and none, introducing them to it. Uh, we got it formally adopted by Birmingham City Council about three or four years ago. So it's been going on quietly, but spectacularly, working with it community grain, no problem at all. So what happened? Well, it's the, as I said at the beginning, it's the arrival of the consultation on mandatory RSA in schools. That has uh, been the catalyst for a whole range of responses, including some pretty unpleasant organisations saying, you know, what we're talking about here really needs to be taught at home or in whether it's church, temple, synagogue, uh, wherever, mosque, um, and 
the state should not be interfering here because you're actually uh, potentially diluting our faith beliefs, our cultural beliefs. And that would be fine to a point, except of course the fulcrum was all about LGBT issues. Nothing else really. Actually, when you, met, you, know, when you stripped it all down, it was all about LGBT. So that's been the catalyst. Um, what's actually happened in Birmingham is really unfortunate because our great majority of schools do teach about LGBT issues in an age appropriate way. Ofsted said Hartfield School, which is where Andy's taught for years, it's all age appropriate, it's absolutely fine, nothing to worry about. And actually, if you look at the materials, I'm sure some of you have looked at the materials, they are so actually innocuous and anodyne. There's not, you know, a couple of penguins, sit, boy penguins sitting around an egg, or a couple of families with two daddies, two mummies, like, it's that kind of level, you know, that kind of age appropriate stuff. Um, a lot of that now is, is jeopardized because, and why this is, why Birmingham, why is it happening in Bradford, or Burnley, or Blackburn, or Luton, or wherever? It's because there are a small minority of activists in Birmingham who, uh, several years ago, decided that they wanted to introduce a, a form of mainstream education based on very, very dated, socially conservative Islamic values. Uh, that became known as the Trojan Horse episode. Uh, that's what took me to Birmingham in the first place, and it took a lot to kind of recenter things after that. So there are people within the Birmingham, Birmingham community who have unique access to how to disrupt state education. And it's really, really distressing to see what, what's happened. That's why only in Birmingham, principally only in Birmingham. And of course, if you're a head teacher, you're the court in the middle here. If you carry on at the moment using the materials, uh, you'll have demonstrations outside your schools. Uh, there are people who will try and set you apart from the community. It's designed to divide where there's been a huge degree of social progress over the years. If you suspend the teaching of no outsiders kind of materials, you're then seen to have capitulated the public, and that puts the head teachers in a, in a, a terrible place because that's not how they are seeing it. It's very hard to find the middle ground there. One thing that's never been reported, well, I try to get some journalists to listen to this, is that when some homophobic graffiti was sprayed on the walls outside the <coughs> school, it was members of the local who removed it. They spent hours scrubbing the walls clean because they were offended by, by what it said. So the great majority of the community, and it is principally the Muslim community in that part of the city, they're fine with things. They're actually fine with things. As my friend, uh, as he says, a Harding, she runs Nelson Mandela School, said, we've known for years that what we teach at school about these issues is likely to differ somewhat from what the children home or in the mosque. That's fine. That's why we have state education. We can relax about that. It's not about indoctrination. Uh, the phrase I use quite often is our, our purpose in education is to help young people make informed choices perhaps then go on to, to live them out in the way that was described earlier. So what should we be doing next? Um, the current kind of polarisation is really Sustainable. Uh, Damien Hines, the Secretary of State, did write quite supportively a week or so ago. That was, that was helpful. That went, went down well. Um, a couple of things I'm going to suggest now, and, and none of this, by the way, is about stepping down in any way from my original proposition at Schools Weeks that teaching LGBT awareness to primary schools as uh, children is absolutely essential. It must, it must continue. And I think the phrase I'll use here, we talked about this a little bit, Jeremy, is what I'm going to call it applied uh, psychodynamics here. Uh, I'm going to invoke a couple of names here. Um, not necessarily recognized as applied psychodynamics, but Stephen Covey's work, I've always said, uh, Stephen Covey is my kind of comfort blanket, if I go to, you know, to seven habits of highly effective people, and I always go back to that book. One of, one of his habits is seek to be understood. You understand. 
in other words, my goodness me, gallons and gallons of tea and coffee he's consuming here. We need a giant listening exercise because a lot of people have been in this kind of fever, climate, have been made afraid of what's happening in their children's primary schools. And we need to know, actually, there's nothing whatsoever to be frightened of here. This is, of course, within British law. It's, it's thoroughly underpinned by the law, endorsed by the law. We're not doing anything outrageous here. We're simply teaching about diversity within our beautifully diverse communities. And of course, you cannot uh, select which equality you fancy. It's no good saying, okay, it's fine, you know, <laughs> on race or religion, but not okay on LGBT. We have to have an equal platform here. So we need to try and reach that position where we uh, understand what the fears are before we can move forward. It is two steps back, one forward, I'm afraid, given what's happened. Um, the second one, and this sounds a little bit trite, is try and go for a win win um, at the moment. Uh, this is being falsely portrayed as a win lose situation. And that is not productive at all. We need to find a way forward with the local community. We carry on teaching in the way that they're, they're comfortable with. It's not about stepping backwards. Um, we talked about, I mentioned it, Miska Salzberg Wittenberger, which won't mean a lot to many of you in the room. Uh, she was a wonderful writer whose work I encountered at Tabby many, many years ago. And she talked about what happens uh, when you are in, in a new situation, really, about your hopes and fears when you encounter a new situation like this. And at the moment, we have a lot of hopes and fears colliding up productively. All we need to do is kind of blend them together very carefully, very sensitively over the next month, year, two, three years ahead, because things have been set, set, set backwards here. Uh, what you values of the British Psychological Society. It's about being judgmental, non-judgmental, about being tolerant, and about being inclusive. And I'm sure we'd all support that, that notion. So it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to get things back on an even keel in Birmingham because of the deliberate vandalism of a very, very small group of activists. That's small and rather sad. So that's where we are. We will progress. We always do. Um, Actually, the bedrock for our work when they're outside is two more things. UNICEF uh, Children's Charter, you know, the 42 rights that are embedded in that. They're actually silenced on sexuality per se, but they're all about children having a voice, being respected, being listened to. So we use that a lot too. I think we've got the tools in the box, it's just how we use them. So that's where we're at Birmingham. Now, so, <laughs> uh, you said please to me no introduction. Um, I was thinking about Peter. I uh, my notes here. I said, when did I first become aware of you? And it was in '83, like a lot, probably a lot of us in the room, because uh, I was teaching in Camden. Uh, I was at the Labour Party in Hackney South in Shoreditch, doing my thing for the party. And then suddenly started reading about uh, what's happening in Bermondsey. Uh, of course, that. That's a pretty dreadful chapter in, in, in political history. So I became of you, uh, where you were campaigning at that time, I think that happened uh, in, in that uh, election. Um, that made me think about something else. So the school I was working at in South Camden, just behind Houston, uh, a good mate of mine, big, big place, big was teacher. Uh, remember him? didn't want to tell me for a long time. And eventually, I said, what's the matter, mate? What is it? He said, more or less kind of, I thought, I'm gay. I said, okay, yeah, yeah, and, and, you know. He said, well, I can't tell the kids. I can't tell the staff room. I, I, I trust you, I'll tell you. So we talked about it, you know, and we became really, really good friends. I thought, God, that was... Anyway, he showed me his dissertation that he'd written for the history of education when he trained to be a teacher about how it felt to be Nick at that point and how it couldn't come out at school and so forth. I thought, oh my God, this, I said, publish it, mate, please. It's just beautifully written. It wasn't an English teacher. He said, I can't. It's just too bloody risky, you know, at the time. Well, I think we have moved on a long way since then. So you, you evoke that era for me, Peter. Um, you do take on some pretty 
political outfits. Uh, the Mugabe regime, uh, the Putin regime, uh, whatever the latest Iraqi regime is, you are utterly fearless. I know you've suffered as a consequence at times. Uh, I used to watch uh, the latest developments in, in outrage. Uh, read my liberal newspaper all the time, the latest bishops or MPs or whatever to be outed because they would not be supportive. <laughs> Yourself over. I think you've done brilliant, brilliant work over the years. Uh, I dislike rap music and a lot of the lyrics and that, and you can play ahead of the curve in pointing out the poisonous nature of the lyrics there. And of course, you'll also support the civil partnerships of white, white people. Most of the country is even thinking about it. So we all owe you a huge debt for the amount of campaigning you've done. Uh, to bring it right up to date, uh, I've read some of your latest materials about what we should be doing in schools, you know, charter and so forth. I think it's brilliant. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, Mr. Visa Tatchell. <laughs> Thank you, Colin, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining me this evening. I'd like to start by thanking the Albany Trust for organizing this inaugural Anthony Gray Memorial Lecture, and also congratulate the Albany Trust on its 60 plus years of humanitarian work for sexual and gender minorities. And I ask you to join me in showing your appreciation for the work of the Albany Trust. Uh, my thanks also to Morgan College, where Anthony Gray studied as an undergraduate, for hosting us this evening. Anthony Gray was a quite extraordinary man, who I personally knew for 30 plus years. He did so much for LGBT plus rights over many, many decades. Most notably, he was the key organizer of the campaign that secured the partial decriminalization of male homosexuality in England and Wales in 1967. A huge positive achievement, albeit with some limitations, not of Anthony's choosing, but of the choosing of the MPs and peers who steered that legislation through. I am absolutely certain that without Anthony's exceptional lobbying skills and persuasive manner, that that law reform would have taken much longer to achieve. And indeed, many more, probably thousands more, gay and bisexual men would have been dragged through the courts. So it is my great honor to give this first inaugural Anthony Gray Memorial Lecture in recognition of his awesome contribution to LGBT plus rights in the UK. Uh, the title of this lecture is What Should Schools Teach Pupils About Sex? It comes at a time when relationship and sex education in schools is a matter of considerable public dispute among some mostly religious parents. Now, Anthony Gray was a very strong advocate of all sexual human rights and of a rational, scientific, humanist approach to sexual matters, including the idea of improved and more frank relationship and sex education in our schools. He wanted to banish the often religious inspired guilt and shame that so frequently damages people's lives and relationships. Anthony was right and that's why ahead of the new relationship and sex education guidelines for schools, planned to come into force in 
2020, and ahead or after the recent supportive vote by an overwhelming majority of MPs, I believe it's time to undertake a further review of the content of relationship and sex education in order to ensure the sexual and emotional health and happiness of young people. Now, it's true the government has already committed to some improvements. That is positive progress. And it's down to the many groups uh, who have been lobbying for this cause in many years. Um, Sex Education Forum, Stonewall, my own foundation, and many, many others. The improvements are welcome, but they don't go far enough. And I want to say that the rationale for additional reforms is as follows. We all know from research that millions of young people enter adulthood emotionally and sexually illiterate, or quasi-illiterate. Many subsequently endure disordered relationships in their later lives ranging from unfulfilling relationships to even outright abusive ones. The result? So much unhappiness, and sometimes mental and physical ill health. And I would say that the lack of effective relationship and sex education in many, or at least some schools, is part of the problem things are getting better compared to just a few years ago. Many more schools are doing much better quality sex and relationship education. But even so, we find in some schools, it can be often vague and euphemistic, including too little detail and not enough explicitness to be a practical benefit. We know that young people keep on saying, we want to know more, that many of their questions and concerns are not being addressed because teachers fear being too explicit. Um, quite a bit of the current RSE concentrates on the biological facts of reproduction, sometimes including other species. Um, in terms of the overall balance, I would say that relatively little teaching is actually about sex or indeed about relationships. And one of the constant complaints of young people is they don't get enough information about relationships, how to deal with emotions, and so on, uh, when they're dating and having uh, sexual liaison. Mostly also, it tends to start too late. Often after many young people have become sexually active and adopted bad habits such as unsafe sex. And it often does not sufficiently or adequately address issues of consent, grooming, abuse, internet safety, sexting, and pornography. Now, of course, there are some schools who are doing a fantastic job on these issues. They are the gold standard. But there are many schools that are not. And I speak probably in 50 or more schools every year. I always ask them about the content of their relationship and sex education. And often I find that it's not really up to scratch. It's not really addressing the issues, or at least all the issues, that young people are rightly concerned about. Obviously, relationship and sex education should not encourage early sex. It is best if young people wait. But it should prepare them for a satisfying state adult, sexual, and emotional life. In the past, the UK's government's education regulatory body, Ofsted, has said that the amount of time spent on relationship and sex education in schools is inadequate, and that much of it is of poor quality. Partly because so few teachers have specialist training in the subject, and sometimes because of screaminess or concerns about the issue itself. Um, there have been many studies which have noted that young people say that the relationship and sex education they receive falls 
far short of what they would like and what they need. So what then needs to change in order to make relationship and education more effective? My starting point is that young people's health and welfare must take priority over squeamishness and embarrassment about sex. There is no way that political, religious, or cultural sensitivities should be allowed to thwart mandatory age-appropriate relationship and sex education in every school from the first year of primary education onwards. Uh, the government has very helpfully made differentiation between RSE at primary level and RSE for secondary pupils. I think that's helpful. Um, broadly speaking, relationship and sex education at primary level should focus on things like physical changes at puberty, relationships, diverse families, and advice about inappropriate touching, grooming, and the importance of reporting sexual abuse. Specific and explicit sex education should begin from the first year of secondary school and become very explicit from the age of 16 onwards. Again, not in order <coughs> to promote sex, but to give young people the knowledge, the skills, the confidence to ensure happy and safe sexual and emotional relations for those who do become sexually active. And of course, we know from the research that the average age of first sexual contact is now about 13 or 14. That's the average age, even though the lawful age of consent is 16. And that contact may not include full sexual intercourse, but maybe heavy petting, touching, mutual masturbation, oral sex, and so on. So quite clearly, young people need to have the information they need to protect themselves and their partners from as early an age as possible. Um, I don't think it's satisfactory to say that these lessons should be left to the goodwill of untrained school staff. Um, to ensure that relationship and sex education is high quality, effective, and achieves the desired goals, we need designated relationship and sex education teachers to be appointed in every school and for these teachers to receive government-funded specialist training so they can deliver these lessons in an effective way. My proposals regarding what should be taught in schools at age-appropriate stages in pupils' lives are as follows. First, mandatory lessons in every school. Sex and relationships are a very important part of most people's lives, most adults' lives. And that's why education about them should be a mandatory part of the curriculum in every school, so that every pupil gets that information, including religious schools, independent schools, and others outside the state sector. I don't think just because schools are state-funded or voluntary-aided that they should be uh, the only ones to get this information and that others should be excluded. I think every pupil in whatever school they attend should get this information. And of course the aim should be to prepare young people for adult life by ensuring that they are sexually and emotionally literate. And moreover, those RSE lessons should be at least monthly all throughout the child's school life. Not once a year or once a term. And of course the lessons should be LGBT uh, plus inclusive. The second, restricted parental opt-out. We don't let parents take their kids out of mathematics or history classes. So why should a parental opt-out be permitted for relationship 
and sex education. Removing pupils from such lessons jeopardizes their emotional, sexual, and physical health. And that cannot be right. Parents who want to withdraw their children should be required to come to each lesson and physically remove their child and then bring them back in good time for the next lesson. This way, the parental opt-out is retained, but the actual opt-out rate is likely to be much reduced. Third, education from the first year of primary school. As I've said, and the government agrees, relationship with sex education needs to be age appropriate. Starting from the first year of primary school by talking about love and relationships, including different types of families, single parent, extended, and same gender families. It should also discuss the correct names of body parts, physical changes at puberty, and to tackle abuse, give information about inappropriate touching and grooming, in order to teach children the differences between caring and exploitative behaviors. One reason for starting at a young age is that many children now begin puberty between the ages of 8 and 12. Long beforehand they, they go through puberty, they need to know about the physical and hormonal changes they will undergo and the feelings and desires they will develop. They need that information. Keeping them ignorant by denying them the facts jeopardizes their happiness and welfare. And that is not what we want. Children of all genders should share relationship and sex education lessons and not be segregated. So we don't want to have separate boys and girls classes. We want these classes to be open to people of all sex, sexes and genders uh, to enable them to learn about each other's bodies right from the start, including boys learning about periods and girls learning about wet dreams. It's about giving kids that information to know about how the other lives and what they experience. Fourth, relationship and sex education lessons should acknowledge the risks and dangers of sex but from the age of 16, should also acknowledge that sex is good for us. It is natural, wholesome, fun, and with safe sex, healthy. We know from the research that quality sex can have a very beneficial effect on our mental and physical well-being. If you're in a happy, fulfilled, sexual emotional relationship is likely to have a very positive uplifting effect on your whole person and your relationship. Young people have a right to know that while sex is not essential for health and happiness, uh, there are some people who are asexual. They get by without sex and that's fine. However, young people also need to know that for most people, Regular, fulfilling sex lifts their spirits and enhances their lives and relationships. That's a positive thing for the individuals and their partners, and overall it's a positive thing for the whole of society. For fifth, overcoming sex shame to tackle abuse. Sexual abuse is a problem, a big problem. Sexual guilt is also a big problem. Sexual guilt causes immense human misery. Not just frustrated, unhappy sex lives, but in many cases, actual psychological and physical ill health. 
and it also helped sustain child sexual abuse. Adults who sexually exploit youngsters often get away with it because the victims feel embarrassed or guilty about sex and are therefore reluctant to report it. If you have sex shame, you're much less likely to feel confident and able to discuss what's been done to you and to report it and get action taken. So I think it's very important that relationship and sex education encourages young people to have a more open and positive attitude towards sexual matters and to teach them the correct names for body parts. So that if they are being abused, they know what to say, they know how to explain it, and they feel confident to do so. I think all the evidence shows that pupils who are knowledgeable about their bodies and who feel at ease talking about sex are much more likely to disclose abuse. Much less guilty and ashamed, much more open to come forward. Sixth, how to have sexual fulfillment. Sexual literacy is important. Good sex isn't obvious. It has to be learned. In the absence of practical information from parents and teachers on how to achieve shared sexual pleasure, many young people are turning to pornography with its unrealistic and often degrading images. To ensure happier, more fulfilled relationships in adulthood, relationship and sex education for pupils aged 16 plus should include advice on how to achieve mutually fulfilling, high quality sex, including the emotional and erotic value of foreplay, the multitude of erogenous zones and how to excite them, and methods to achieve pleasure for oneself, and very importantly, for one's partner. I'd say this is particularly important for boys who often know very little about female sexual anatomy and how to give a female partner fulfillment. We need to overcome that imbalance, the way in which boys often regard the female body as a foreign place, a place about which they know little. And that is why so many girls and young women say their sexual experiences, at least their early ones, are often so unfulfilled and unsatisfactory because the boys did not know how to give them pleasure. They didn't understand about the clitoris and about the erogenous zones that excite and give women fulfillment. So we need to acknowledge that. This is about empowering women. And you know, misogyny comes in very many different guises. And one of them is about the ignorance with which boys and young men have about uh, female sexual anatomy. Uh, seventh, a new ethical framework of mutual consent, respect, and fulfillment. It's very important that relationship and sex education acknowledges diverse sexual orientations, gender identities, and relationships while also giving teens guidance on their rights and responsibilities, including teaching about consent and abuse issues. I would say that a positive ethical framework can be summed up in three very simple principles. Mutual consent, reciprocal respect, and shared fulfillment. If those three principles are followed, you don't have abusive relationships. You don't have one partner getting pleasure at the expense of the other. And the great advantage of those three principles is that they apply universally, regardless of whether people are married or single, monogamous or promiscuous, hetero, bisexual, homo, trans, or intersex. 
These are principles, three core principles that everyone can apply and will make them and their relationships happier and better. Eight, promoting safer alternatives, such as oral sex and mutual masturbation. If schools are serious about cutting the incidence of teen pregnancies, abortions, and HIV and other sex infections, they should practically highlight to pupils aged 16 and older the various safer, healthier alternatives to vaginal and anal intercourse. Sadly, a lot of young people seem to think that intercourse is the be all and end all, that that is real sex and everything else is second best. Well, schools need to challenge that. And in so doing, they can help reduce teen pregnancies, unwanted teen pregnancies, abortions, and sexual infections. As we know, oral sex and mutual masturbation carry no risk of conception and are much lower risk of HIV. Um, I would say that the most effective way to persuade teenagers to switch to these safer alternatives is by making them look and sound appealing. To glamorize them, to make them feel sexy. Explaining that they can be sexually fulfilling and emphasizing the clear advantages over intercourse. So for example, no worries about unwanted conceptions, reduced HIV risk, and no need to use the pill or condom. These are tangible, positive uh, gains looking at these alternatives. Uh, while mutual masturbation is safe, oral sex can, of course, transmit some sexual infections. So young people need to be made aware that oral sex is safer than intercourse, but it's not risk-free. But having said that, if more young people switch to oral sex, we would reduce the level of unwanted teen pregnancies and abortions, and we would uh, reduce the incidence of HIV. Um, lessons ought to also include advice that if young people do become sexually active, it is recommended they get vaccinated against HPV and hepatitis. Nine, sexual rights are human rights. Relationship and sex education should be based on and espouse the principle that there is, that there is a fundamental human right to love an adult person of any gender, to engage in any mutually consensual, harmless sexual act with them, and to share a happy, healthy sex life. That, to me, is a human right. Human rights are all about stopping abuse and ensuring human happiness. We need to make that really clear in our schools, that sexual rights are human rights. 10, hetero, homo, and bi are equally valid. When based upon mutual consent, respect, and fulfillment, the three core principles I outlined, all relationships with persons of any gender, or I want to emphasize all adult relationships with persons of any gender, are equally morally valid. While schools should not promote any particular sexual orientation, they should encourage understanding and acceptance of heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, and pansexual orientations, and transgender and intersex identity. Doing this is vital to ensure self-acceptance by pupils with such orientations or identities, and to help combat prejudice, discrimination, bullying, and hate crime. 11, the right to sexual self-determination. It's my body and my right to control it. 
That should be the mantra in every school, to ensure that young people assert their right to determine what they and others do with their body, including the right to abstain from sex, to say no to sex, and to report abuse. This ethos of self-determination is vital, crucial, to thwart people who attempt to pressure youngsters into unwanted sex, abusive relationships, and risky sex. The right to self-determination is the core principle of good relationship and sex education. Twelve, live and let live. Human sexuality embraces a glorious diversity of emotions and desires. We're all unique, with our own individual erotic and emotional tastes. People are fulfilled in a huge variety of different ways. What turns one person on may not work for someone else, and vice versa. But providing behavior is consensual between adults, where no one is harmed and the enjoyment is reciprocal, schools should adopt a non-judgmental live and let live attitude. They should not be in the business of prescribing morality beyond the three core principles of mutual consent, respect, and fulfillment. Thirteen, advice on internet safety. The nowadays widespread access to the internet and social media has exposed many young people to pornography, sexting, and the risks of grooming abuse and online harassment. These issues, and how to stay safe online, need to be a cornerstone of relationship and sex education lessons, so that teens can be aware of the dangers and protect themselves. 14, respect for sexual diversity. Our desires and temperaments are not the same. There is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to sex, love, and relationships. Providing they fall within the ethical framework of adult mutual consent, respect, and fulfillment, it is not the business of RSE in schools to neglect sexual diversity or to endorse sexual conformity. We really do have to have, we really do have to have a ethos of respect for sexual diversity, which of course many schools are increasingly embracing, perhaps even most schools. And finally, 15, give pupils all the facts. Sex education from the age of 16 ought to tell the whole truth about every kind of sex and relationship, including perhaps sexual practices that some people might find distasteful. Now the purpose of such frankness is not to encourage these practices, but to help people deal with them if they encounter them in later life. And this includes advising them on their right to refuse to participate in sexual practices that they dislike or object to. But these are the range of sexual practices you may not like them, or you may like them, but it's your choice and your decision. Don't let someone else pressure you into doing things that you may find objectionable. So finally, it's over to the Education Secretary. I would appeal to the government to ensure that these proposals and those of other organizations like the Sex Education Forum for much improved relationship and sex education lessons are a statutory requirement in all schools and that they're LGBT plus inclusive. I say that solely and purely from the motivation of safeguarding and protecting young people's health and welfare. If their health and welfare comes first, and I believe it should, we have to address these issues. We have to address them in a frank, upfront way that enables young people 
to have the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence to assert the kind of sex relationships and feelings that they want. Not what society imposes upon them, not what religious institutions dictate, not what peers or elderly people propose, but what they want, what fulfills them. So it's about listening to young people. And all these ideas I've discussed, shared with you tonight, are based upon the many discussions I've had with young people in schools over the last 30 years that I've been doing it. These are the issues they say concern them. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I want to pay tribute to the many, many organizations, particularly the Sex Education Forum, Stonewall, and many other organizations who are pushing forward to try and ensure that sex and relationship education in our schools is up to scratch. Young people deserve nothing less. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That was uh, a stirring, <coughs> relevant, rigorous uh, call for uh, uh, serious change, serious improvement in our schools, teaching of RSE. So we've had um, we've had Colin setting out uh, some of the current kind of problems uh, that have been happening in Birmingham. Uh, we've had Peter uh, setting out a, a very rigorous set of proposals and, and demands for what we should do. And I now have the pleasure to invite uh, Sydney Bertrand Shelton, who leads the education and schools work in Stonewall, to tell us how you're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And well done with my name. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sydney. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I work at Stonewall. We work with over 1,300 schools across the country. Uh, they are primary schools, secondary schools, colleges, special schools, faith and church schools, um, schools for the faith, uh, people majority, a whole range of schools. I guess perhaps what I wanted to talk about is sex education and relation to sex education is really, really important. But I suppose I perhaps focus on the practicalities of how we get parents on board, how we talk about faith, and how we do that by bringing everyone same page. I agree with much of what Peter has said, especially the listening to young people themselves, because if there's anything I know is that we should just listen to them far, far more often. That's actually what I spend my time doing, with working with teachers, just listen to young people yourself. Um, okay, I think I, I wanted to start with how things have been portrayed in the press lately, because whilst a small number of shown uh, people have shown opposition to LGBT inclusive relationships education and relationships and sex education. There are so many more LGBT people, allies, people of faith, organisations who've shown their support for talking about LGBT people and relationships throughout school life. Um, and I really want to highlight the voices that are missing when you're when you're reading those headlines and when you're seeing um, those things on social media. It, it ignores the voices of LGBT people of faith. And it ignores the voices of people who are faith who are supportive of things of, of education being LGBT inclusive. And it ignores the voices of children and young people themselves. And that's all children and young people, not just those who may grow up to identify as LGBT, not just those who come from LGBT families, um, but actually all children and young people and the LGBT people that I suppose they will meet as they grow up. And it also ignores the experiences of LGBT teachers. Can they be themselves in their workplace? Can they use the pronoun that they feel most comfortable with? Can they talk about their partner? Um, those are the kinds of things that I think about. And it reminds us at Stonewall of uh, Section 28 and the way that that talks about uh, the promotion of um, homosexuality in schools and how afraid we were of that. And it's so interesting when you think about, well, Disney, I guess. <laughs> how, how often do you see um, do you see straight couples marry and the prince and the princess? And we, you know, we, we think we have to be fooled that from the moment that they're born. Um, right. But I would like to start with the success, just as was highlighted right at the start, which was about the uh, Commons vote and 538 who voted in favour of relationships education, relationships and sex education. I know we keep saying relationships education, relationships and sex education. It's because it's really important when we're talking about the difference between primary schools and secondary schools. Um, what, I, what I really like about the new guidance is the way that it talks about what we should be doing in primary schools. So, did, we should be talking about different families in relationships education. And actually, um, parents can't opt out of that. So it's about uh, single parent families, LGBT parents, families headed by grandparents, adoptive parents, foster carers and parents and other structures. It's so 
diverse in the way that it looks at what a family structure can be. And it also says that teaching should reflect the law. And then in secondary schools, it's about relationships and sex education. And again, the relationships education is the, the really core cool part there. I guess for me, and the work that we do with schools, I, I don't just want to see LGBT inclusion in relationships and sex education. I want to see it everywhere. I want to see it in your history lessons, I want to see it in your math lessons, in your art, in absolutely everything that you do. And I'm not saying it should all be rainbow all the time, but we should be learning about our histories and the diversity and all of our diversity throughout every aspect of the curriculum. Now I'm going to focus a little bit on faith and church schools and what that this might mean. Our work has always focused on building bridges between communities to create a more accepting world for all LGBT people. It doesn't mean we're always perfect at it, but it means that we definitely learn from our mistakes. And I think that so many faiths um, focus and centre on messages of love, respect and acceptance, and that these messages are so core to religions, that creating LGBT inclusive learning environments um, is because of their faith and it's not in spite of it. That's where I've seen this work be done amazingly, amazingly really well. And I've got some examples of where that's been done well too. You've got Valley More God's Children, which was written by the Church of England in 2017. And that's about tackling homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic bullying and language in Church of England schools. And that even shaped the way that they are inspected by their own um, science inspectorate. And then you've got Made in God's Image by the Catholic Education Service, and that focuses on tackling homophobic, and biphobic, bullying and language in schools. Um, and then the well-being of LGBT pupils, a guide for Orthodox Jewish schools, which was an amazing resource made for, by the Office for the Chief Rabbi and um, Kushet in 2018. Now, the last one, I guess, it's more explicitly focuses on supporting LGBT young people, but all of them focus on tackling homophobic, biphobic um, language and transphobic bullying language. And I think that's where this work starts for a lot of schools. If you think about um, a journey that you might go on, you've got to start at the first point before you can build on the rest. Now, the other thing that's so frustrating about the, the way that the press talks about it is that it gives you the impression that schools are opting out of doing it and they're not doing it, um, if they ha were doing it, that they've stopped doing it. And that's not true. There are so many, there are hundreds of schools who are doing this work really, really well. Of course, there's some stuff that I think could be doing better, but there are so many schools doing brilliant work already. Um, so what do we see as best practice? It's embedded into the school values. It's embedded into absolutely everything that the school does. And also it's in line with the Equality Act, like has already been talked about. So the, the, what's really helpful is the public sector equality duty. And there's one thing that I really love from this, which is um, fostering good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not. And for me, no, no part of this does this echo more than this line in particular about fostering good relations between people who have a protected characteristic and those who don't. Um, of course, when you're working with, uh, with children and young people in a school, you don't know necessarily they will grow up to identify as LGBT. You don't know necessarily um, what things will, will happen to them in their lives, what protective characteristics they will identify with. But fostering those good relationships are so important. Ofsted also look at it, which is a really good scary thing to bring up sometimes. Um, and then the best, the best work I've seen is invite, schools inviting LGBT people of faith or people who of faith who have LGBT inclusive approaches to come and speak about that in school. Um, the rhetoric so often ignores LGBT people of faith is quite frustrating. Um, and their experiences are of course as diverse as, as anybody else's. All right, parents and carers. What I know is that when parents understand what the content of the teaching involves and why it's important, they're so much less likely to withdraw their children. Um, and we know that the rates of withdrawal have been really low when parents have been effectively engaged with. So then it's a conversation about what does effective engagement look like. I suppose it's back to the start of um, what does listening look like? What does um, having good, good conversations look like? I thought it was really interesting because Leeds Beckett University did a survey of teachers and parents and they found that 94% felt that it was important for schools to teach children about LGBT identities. And the same percentage felt that schools had a responsibility to promote LGBT inclusion. And if you look at, um, it's a quite an old report, but it's Stonewall's Living Together, it found that actually parents would prefer the schools talking about LGBT inclusion so that they didn't have to. <laughs> and I do feel a little bit for parents. When did they learn about LGBT things in the schools? When did, um, when did this language and this way of talking about it be something that they ever had access to? And if you were to Google it, would you find the right information right away? I'm not sure that you would necessarily. So sometimes we talk about how can we best bring parents on board, but also give them a chance to catch up, perhaps. <laughs> I said that not as a parent, so it's okay if you want to. Um, <laughs> I think what's also 
interesting that that survey also found people were more resistant or more nervous about LGBT inclusion when it came to primary school ages. And this really makes me think of um, Section 28 and the idea of promoting ideas and can actually promoting an idea really fundamentally change anybody? I'm not sure, but I do think it can tell you that who you are is okay and what your difference is is fine and you are valid as yourself and diversity is beautiful and everybody brings different things to it. And that is really the conversation we're talking about in primary school. Um, so in primary schools, this conversation about different families they love is um, recognizing that children will come from LGBT families, that they will meet LGBT people in their lives, or they will see them on YouTube. Um, and it's also about attacking gender stereotypes, so that the boy who um, isn't good at sports and the girl who really is, and actually the kids who um, who enjoys playing up with the dressing up box, so they all feel equally valued and celebrated, actually, as well. So. Best practice for me, what I see in schools, um, policies that explicitly mention the Equality Act and the protected characteristics within that. And I mean anti-bullying policies, schools of quality diversity policies, I mean homeschool agreements, I mean displays when you walk into the school that highlight the diversity of um, the school's community and diversity in general. If I walk into a school and it's got a board up to celebrate LGBT History Month, especially secondary, I want to see on that board that there are LGBT people of colour, that there are LGBT disabled people, that there are um, a whole range of possibilities of what it is to be LGBT, but also to celebrate diversity in all of its forms throughout. And when we're looking at a primary school, I want to see the kids that draw pictures of their own families and every single family celebrated. Um, have I missed anything? Ah, invite, um, you know, this whole thing about listening, inviting parents and carers in to look at the policies, to consult on them and, and to work on them together. I think that's really how we will get somewhere with it. Um, but it's true that a real challenge is that teachers don't get training specifically on relationships and sex education in a way that's um, as widespread as, for example, maths or, or science. Um, but the best work I've seen is where it's been student-led. And students can actually be so powerful in getting parents and carers on board. So I, I fundamentally agree that pupils and students need to know what healthy relationships look like. That's so important. I also think that um, young people should know that the label that you're assigned and given when as soon as you're born doesn't have to be the, the thing that defines you. Um, and actually that relationships to sex education should absolutely by, be led by the needs of children and young people themselves. Um, even I am out of date. <laughs> but what I did, um, I looked at some stats and I found um, some really interesting things. So Brooke, which is a great charity, did a research report with um, CEOP in 2017 called Digital Romance, and they found that LGBT young people were more likely than others to have asked someone out online and to have dated someone that they've met online. And significantly more non-binary gender young people, as people who don't identify as um, male or female but can move between the two or, or be more static. Forgive me, that's not a great off-the-cuff definition, I can give you a proper one. Um, but non-binary gender young people had met someone online they had then started seeing compared to cisgender as people who aren't trans, boys and girls. And significantly or why young people have done so as well. I think it's so interesting when you look at LGBT, it's often like an umbrella that's lumped together, but there are so many nuances within. We learn so much about being in our life between and amongst ourselves as well as we do um, more externally. So I guess it's just highlights the different experiences of bi young people and non-binary young people as well. <coughs> Finally, um, the school report stats. Nearly nine in 10 LGBT <coughs> pupils have learned about contraception and safe sex, safe sex at school, but only one in five and only one in 10 trans pupils um, learned about this in relation to same sex. And 13% have learned about how to have healthy relationships in relation to same sex relationships. 13%. <laughs> I just, I don't even know how you're supposed to go out into the world and, and navigate without being taught relationships to sex education that's relevant to you. Um, and we know that this has an impact on the well-being of young people. More than two in five LGBT pupils don't feel able to be themselves. And more than two, in, yeah, and the same statistic again, including half of trans pupils don't feel part of their school community. How, do you, how are you supposed to focus on your lessons if you don't feel like you belong? How are you supposed to um, be able to pay attention if you don't feel like you can be yourself? Um, and this is probably universal for a lot of children and young people, but specifically for LGBT young people as well. And I started by saying all the voices that I thought were missing, so I thought I'd end with some um, quotes from young people from, uh, from the report, which, which asked young people aged 11 to 19, about just under 4,000 of them, what they thought about their life and education. So, um, if I knew what trans meant at an earlier enough age, I might have had an easier time at school. 
I went through a period of being very anxious and depressed because I was so confused about my own gender identity and I didn't feel I had anyone I could talk to about it. I couldn't figure out why I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. That's Matthew, who's now 19, in college in the Southwest. All of the sex education sessions throughout school were regarding heterosexual relationships. It was always assumed that everyone in the class was straight. That's Phoebe, who's 18 and now at university. And I just want to end with one, one glimmer of hope. <laughs> In my previous school, we had a really great PSHE teacher who just gave us the space to talk about LGBT issues where we all felt comfortable and accepted. Like, 18, not 16. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for me. And that uh, uh, gives the chair, um, on the one hand, uh, very easy job in the sense that all our speakers have fantastically stuck to time. So we now have an opportunity for questions and answers from you, but there is the difficult part of the job is that we've heard three speakers who all more or less agree with each other. <laughs> so uh, your responsibility, I think, uh, is to find some areas which I'm sure Anthony Gray would have found. Uh, of, of disagreement, or of skepticism, or of question, or of challenge uh, to what we've been hearing. Uh, that's at least my, my task thrown over to yourself. So um, we have a row of him with Mark. So who would like to start us off? You're relying on the chair to start us off. Right. Would you like to say say your your name? Do I need a mic? Like, I'll probably be here. I think so. It's all good. <laughs> uh, I'm Tay. Really awesome talk. Really good to hear lots of like, yeah, similar but slightly different different perspectives. Um, I guess my question um, is kind of about um, the content of what we're going to be teaching in schools, and specifically this idea around teaching people what healthy relationships are. Um, and particularly, I guess, around sexual violence and sexual abuse. We've talked a lot about how sexual shame can stop people from speaking out, but I wanted to hear kind of about how we will teach young people to also not perpetrate sexual violence specifically. Um, there was a paper I read earlier this year, for example, which showed that um, the rate of sexual violence towards bisexual youth is uh, like much higher enriched by the age of 14 compared to gay and straight um, equivalents, also slightly higher for gay people compared to straight people. So it seems that by the age of 14, people have already learned to treat bisexual people terribly, which is really heartbreaking, but it also kind of shows uh, that people are picking up these ideas very young, so like preventative action is needed. So I, I kind of wondered what all the panelists thought would be like a good way to go about that and how to start those kind of really tough conversations to be had. Great, thank you for that. Uh question which fulfills, I think, my criteria for challenge. So I'm going to go to, to, Colin to start with then on the, uh, the difficult areas of uh, okay. things that are happening. Is that live? Is that yeah. Is the mic uh, on? So you can yeah. just press this ah. button there. Push. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Really good points there. It was kind of, a lot of that was reverberating as I was listening to colleagues here. I think what we're touching on here is uh, sort of think about how we prepare teachers right through from the early years, through to those who are working with 16, 17, 18 year olds, to teach this really well. And it's not like a canon of knowledge, as people have touched on about maths or history or whatever, at least not on the surface it isn't. We're into really complex understandings. We, in our profession, we wrap it up in terms of personal, social, health, ed, or social, moral, cultural, whatever. Actually, what we need here are colleagues who know themselves pretty well and understand their journey to how they've become who they are now as adults working with young children. Um, Many teachers, I don't want to stereotype too much, but like to stand behind their subject discipline, particularly in secondary schools. And I do recall uh, when we launched kind of some of these kind of things in, in London, 
a lot of teachers just backed off from it. You know, they were frightened of working in the effective domain. They felt really ill-prepared for it. And I think we've got a huge training job here. So I'm a little bit nervous about Peter's suggestion about uh, the designated teacher, because the risk there potentially is what, what I call music teacher syndrome in secondary schools, where every kid's taught by the, the one music teacher. I think it's a whole state of responsibility. <coughs> But, uh, but to get us to the right levels of awareness, emotional literacy, and, and factual knowledge uh, is a huge job, and I'm totally with Peter in terms of this needs a huge amount of funding and resources and commitment. Uh, but we mustn't underestimate the challenge. We, whilst people do really, really well out there, um, where we could be, and I think your, 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 your charge as it were, you know, gosh, we haven't got the workforce ready to do that yet. So it's a great challenge. Thank you. Thanks. Peter, your three principles that you outlined would, would at least in theory address what Tay is talking about um, and provide a framework for trying to discuss those sorts of issues. But just to be challenging uh, uh, these are principles that you've been talking about for, I should say, 30 years. And uh, in the days of safer sex education, you were talking about these, particularly, of course, to uh, the populations at risk. Uh, and yet, at Albany Trust, of course, uh, we see uh, people who have experienced abuse, have experienced violence in relationships. And, it's not that people don't have the knowledge or indeed the awareness of those sorts of principles in theory, but actually the behavior hasn't really changed in many respects. We see still a lot of damaging behavior, including in the gay community in particular, still going on. So just information, education, doesn't seem to be enough to bring about the kind of change that I think Taylor's I think you're right, and I would say that the kind of agenda that I've outlined needs to go hand in hand with challenging machismo, because we don't want to be stereotypical, but on the whole, violence in general, and sexual violence in particular, is mostly perpetrated by men against either other men or more often against women. So challenging macho attitudes, I think, is a crucial component or dimension of helping to ensure more respectful, non-abusive, non-violent relationships. So I would like to see in PSHE and other aspects of the curriculum a lot more attention focused on, on challenging that. And I think um, you know, it is very, very clear that there are strands of youth culture which have quite high toxic levels of masculinity, um, which is actually glorified and rarely ever challenged. And I think it needs to be challenged. I think we, we need to say that these kinds of attitudes towards women, this kind of attitude, me first, you know, the sort of very um, narcissistic, my satisfaction mentality, has to be questioned and challenged. And that part of that is challenging the imbalance between the genders and the way in which some men, not all men obviously, but some men have this very masculinist view of it's my right or what I want I get and there are elements of strands of youth culture that actually reinforce that I think they need to be challenged. Thank you So we've got uh, three questions so um, I'll, I'll take all three questions and then ask uh, in fact we've got four questions I'll take all four questions and then I'll ask the panelists to res respond um, uh, so yes no. You, you did have an answer. Do you want me to do it really quickly? If you could, yeah. <laughs> I'll do it because I think it's a good one. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so there's this quote in the school report that I that really resonated with me, and it was, it was by a young person who said they didn't feel like they were given the tools by the school to understand their bisexuality. And I'm going to focus specifically on the bi thing that you raised because I think it's so um, important. I think lots of things about the way that RSC is taught at the moment make it harder to understand. Um, by relationships, but also like 
beautiful. And I don't. I think it doesn't help that we tend to split sessions by like boy girl. I don't think it's helpful that we tend to assume that people are either um, straight or gay. I don't think it's helpful that we tend to assume that everybody in the room is a trans, for example. Um, I think teacher confidence is a huge issue. I think when teachers are feel more confident to talk about LGBT and that's everything under that umbrella, that we will see a change there. I think the teachers already do quite good training, uh, well, quite good lessons on identifying abusive relationships and things like that, but they need to get more confident in talking about it. And I, I have been wrestling with how, what does a bi-inclusive lesson look like? What does a bi-inclusive relationship in education look like? I think it's case studies that show the journey of somebody and their relationships. and then and then it's um, working through that as a class. Um, and then the best the best work I've seen is where students review their own relationships as sex education, say, you know, we never learned about this and it would have been really helpful. That's the best of work I've seen. And, um, and then, oh, I'm sad, sorry, it's a final sad point, but I think that abusive relationships are hard to leave. And I think that's a, that's the truth. That's why I think that will probably always happen. What we need to do is make sure that we talk more about LGBT in every service that already exists, in every part where we're already identifying and um, challenging that, and so that everything we do is more inclusive, so it's easier, to, anything we can do to make it easier to get the help when you need it, or when you can identify it. That was, that was very helpful. We've, we've got four questions, mm -hmm. and we've got about six minutes to be able to answer them, so they're going to have to be rapid fire questions and, and answers, so I'm going to go in that direction. First of all, well, my name is Francesca, I'm a member of this college, and I'm very glad that I came tonight. I'm actually heterosexual, and I wish I had learned a lot more about the LGBTQ community much earlier in my life. Um, I would like to follow on from the question you raised about preventing um, abuse and sexual assault um, among youth. Chances are that when you're teaching this sort of thing in a classroom, that you have someone in that classroom who's already experienced it. And when you, I, I feel that there is a, a lot of emphasis on, on preventing assault and abuse, um, by empowering people, by sexual self-determination, as you, as you uh, called it. Those precise messages can be very hurtful to people who've already experienced it because they feel that they didn't react that way. Is that something that is considered when you draw up um, guidance for, uh, for schools or for teachers? How do you address that problem? Great question. Uh, Re-traumatizing the people who've already been traumatized unintentionally by the way things are being discussed. Basically, yes, because I know that a lot of people find math classes traumatizing, but that's a whole different level from what a sexual education class is. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think there was a question in the middle, yeah. yeah. There are really three observations. The, f the first is that 16 to 18 seems to be very late to leave the sorts of things you're talking about. Whether it should be the case or not, 16 is the age of marriage in this country. The idea that you're old enough to get married at 16, but you might have to wait to 16, 17, 18 seems to me to be leaving it far, far too late. It, it, it's, it's closing far too many stable doors on doors as long as it's bolted. So that's the first observation I wanted to make. The second was triggered by some comments you made before I thought I wanted to ask a question, and that's about machismo. And one of the things I wanted to say is that we, particularly tertiary education, which I am involved in, we really have to think seriously about the way in which so much of what we do uh, in, within the university sector is rooted in competition, in exclusion, in, in I am better than you, I got a 2-1, you only got a 2-2, two, two, and but anyway, I shouldn't have had a first, etc. But build in to what we do often, unless we work very hard as supervisors and directors of studies to militate against it, is a sort of which is about off the mind, which has got nothing to do with your anatomy and nothing to do with your genitalia. And that's something that we really should be thinking about very carefully if we really want the sort of wide, proper, transformative changes that you all of you in, in your different ways have been talking about. The third thing, which is what I was going to say uh, before the other two, was, uh, and this is a question rooted in ignorance on my part, uh, I don't know what sort of LGBTQ work is being done in the reformulation or the overhauling of disciplinary curricula uh, at, at, at a secondary level, but it seems to me there are three very obvious disciplines where so much could be done. One is my own discipline, which is English literature, the other is history, and the other is music. 
uh, all these are, of course, they are the effective disciplines. They are disciplines where, just by teaching English all the time, we are happy to deal with, we like it or not, somehow, with rape, incest, bigamy, sexual assault, violence, betrayal, treachery, murder, etc. It, it, it is our bread and butter. And the idea to put a warning, trigger signal over everything, it has to be a lot of really dangerous, slippery slope stuff. So um, the question was whether anyone can give me information about whether there is integrated work going on in those different disciplines, specific areas, to, to do that, that complete comprehensive addressing right. of LGBTQ. Um, um, it's being embedded in which areas of the curriculum? Uh, Thank you. I'm happy I'm going to partially address that myself. Go ahead. So I'm a, I'm a secondary English teacher, but I also coordinate, or have in the past coordinated, sex relationships education across a whole school, secondary school, in a school where it was predominantly a uh, faith community. So I know a lot of the challenges and have worked, you know, as a permanent member of staff dealing with those challenges. And also bringing on a whole team of people, a 20 teachers on to teach English sexual education, um, who have never experienced that before and have not been taught that themselves at school. And uh, conducting that training from scratch without having received any training myself. So it is true. And do, do you mind, can I ask which way? So, yeah, so, sorry. so th thank you for that okay. contribution. I'm going to take your question as being one of funding and training. Where is that going to come from? Um, and I'm going to ask then, uh, starting with Colin. Can uh, I make one point, please? Uh, uh, Andrew, sorry, yes. Uh, the reason is that I think, uh, if I speak as the ghost of Anthony Gray, this is dedicated <laughs> to the memory of Anthony Gray. And as many people here know, my name is Andrew. I knew him from the 1940s. Uh, shortly after he left Morton College. And I think the question he would ask is one that appears to be lacking from the whole of the conversation, and that is the biology. And I'll just very swiftly say what it is I mean, or that I think Anthony would mean, because we often talk to these things. I have recently read suggestions that the hymen usually dissolves while the baby is in the womb. I have recently read that sperm takes something like 64 days to become the full sperm from the initial, whatever that tiny little beginning itself is. It seems to me that most people 
go to school, leave school, live their entire adult lives, and Anthony used to say this, without grasping the biology. And I understand that the biology, <coughs> the knowledge of it, is constantly changing. So to deal only with relationships is to begin at point two. I understand that we can't in primary schools be talking about all the physical aspects. But women are never going to be understood by men until men have to know the physiology of women. And women have always been faster to grasp the physiology of men. But even that is being re-understood. So my question to a panel would be, how do you teach so that an adult will understand the, their own physiology and the other genders through okay. physiology? So well, that would be my guess at Anthony's question. So uh, science, uh, to, to, to end with, is the fourth question then. So, We've got a question about um, uh, pre preventing uh, abuse unintentionally through re-traumatizing people who have experienced it. But we've got a question about embedding um, uh, RSC and LGBT into different parts of the curriculum. A question about funding and training, and a question about the facts of life and the science uh, involved. Oh. Okay. Twitter versions, because I feel like we could op open up something here, which you actually literally talk about hours and hours, some rich seams here. Um, okay, biology first. Uh, such facts are taught in primary. Uh, you'd be amazed at some of the conversations that happen with three and four year olds in the nurseries. Uh, they ask wonderfully uh, penetrating questions about biology, and that's where it starts. And I think the challenge for us as professionals is to be open and the opposite of squeamish about, about those conversations. So they do start, but the issue is the inconsistency of access to such things. Um, secondly, um, in terms of the curriculum, oh yes, yes, in, in another horribly contemporary context I was talking about, if you ever wanted to work I play Romeo and Juliet, knife crime at the moment. It's all there. You know, what's happening on the estates is much cuter than calculus, isn't it? It's before our eyes. So, yes, the problem with that at the moment, and I'm not a negative person, you probably can't that, is that the GCSEs at the moment, the new variety of GCSEs, are so content heavy. And if I get into neo conversions of education, all the rest of it, they're driving us down a content rich, anal analysis light version of how we deal with the arts, the classroom music, and so forth. So, yes, we, we should do more with that. Um, accidentally, inadvertently re traumatizing. Yes, I, I, for me, uh, when, when you're working as a, a class teacher, the average group size, you know, 20, 25, 30, and so forth. There are times when you will do that, yes, and you have to be really hyper aware that it's going to happen. For me, it's, it, it, it's an intersection here with safeguarding, and I mean safeguarding in the wider sense of the word, that when such things happen, they will happen. Quite often, what happens in a, in a really healthy learning environment is that somebody's going to come up to you afterwards and talk to somebody else about how you know, touch on something there, and it's the opportunity for that private discourse, a safe space. So I, I, I fear that in, we still have a Victorian model of education. We still, you know, work to the clock with groups of a certain size in Victorian school houses. Stuff like that's going to happen. I'm not cavalier about it. But funding and resourcing, finally. Um, this is hugely underfunded. But as we are the sixth nation in the world, that goes for our whole state education system. We should be putting a lot more into this. Sadly, at the moment, the, the, the principal domain that characterizes our education system is, is, is one of uh, machismo and who's on top and all the rest of it. So, 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 so uh, we've got a lot to turn around. Thank you, Colin. You, you've given four fantastic answers to all four questions. So I'm going to liberate Peter uh, and Sydney answering the four and perhaps just ask you to uh, pick up uh, any one of those questions that you'd like to, to comment on.
Peter. In terms of spanning out LGBT plus issues into the whole curriculum, I totally agree. And for those of you who don't know, there's a very good website called The Classroom, which provides ready-made lessons for teachers to download to integrate LGBT plus issues into mathematics, physics, history, science, whatever. Um, it's a really good example of how you can make LGBT plus issues embedded in the whole curriculum rather than just sticking them in PSHE or relationships and certification. Um, over 30, well almost 30 years ago, um, I was invited to go to Germany to give lessons, um, especially produced and organized lessons as part of a research project for the German education system. And obviously I had to go to schools where they spoke good English because sadly my German is not up to scratch. Um, I was told to make these lessons as explicit as I wish and the more explicit the better. And I was given uh, different pupil ages, um, 11 to 13, 14 to 15, and then 16 plus. All the kids had to get written permission from their parents to attend these lessons. Um, no other teachers were present in the room, although sneakily they had um, a two-way mirror and uh, an audio um, feed of, of what, what I was saying and what the pupil's response was. Um, the feedback from the teachers and the parents was that um, it was the best response they ever had from pupils, that because I was outside of the school, I wasn't part of the school system, because you know, I was an, essentially an anonymous person, they felt able to talk about anything they wanted to. So they asked questions they would never dare ask their teachers. Um, feedback from the parents was uh, there wasn't a single complaint from parents and the repeated um, feedback from most parents was um, for the first time they felt able to discuss on their child's initiative based on the lessons that I'd given sexual and emotional matters which they hadn't felt confident to, to address or broach. Um, so I think it shows that being explicit and very frank actually can pay dividends in the right circumstances and framework. The final point I just addressed, the Alison's point, 16 is a very arbitrary age, and I agree that essentially if young people have their first sexual experience around the age of 13 or 14, 16 is really too late. So um, I guess it, it, it's graduations of explicitness. So you know, the really explicit stuff probably could only be agreed by a government from 16 plus, but still quite a lot of explicit stuff should, I think, ideally be introduced around 11, 12, and 13. So that, as you've suggested, before young people become sexually active, they get the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence to make wise, responsible decisions. So if, if we had found an answer to Andrew's question and found a way to clone Peter, we could we could do away with sex altogether and just unleash Peter on all the schools. <laughs> so, <laughs> come to East End of Birmingham. <laughs> Good kid. Uh, so, Sydney, uh, a few final then to respond to the questions. Yeah, um, just very quickly, how do you teach uh, biology in a way that adults can understand their own and others? I think the way that I understand it, and I don't think that I completely understand it just yet, but is that it would be really good if we talked about body parts as opposed to um, perhaps like becoming a man and becoming a woman, just that these are body parts, this is what kind of puberty would look like with these body parts. Um, and I think one of the key things, probably for all adults, is to understand the difference between um, sex and gender, and that is the biology and the, the gender bit, right? But I seem to have that conversation so often. Um, and also that means that we'd be able to better incorporate and include sex as well, I think, in the way that we learn about biology and gender. The, the challenge with all of this, of course, no surprise, resource and time and funding, um, which I think brings me on to the, uh, the teacher's question because I just, yes, it's absolutely brilliant to hear from a, a teacher because it's very easy, I think, for us to say what we think it should be, but the challenge, until it is well resourced and well funded and there is the training that, that's needed, we have to make it work for the, the, real, the realistic timetables the teachers have. We have to make whatever our ideas are fit into whatever it is that will actually get picked up and used by the teachers on the ground. Until, until 
until this wonderful um, revolution we have planned arises. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So it's just left me to. Uh, since we are slightly over time, to say thank you for being a very uh, engaged uh, audience and for coming along today, and to thank once more then our three great speakers, Colin, Peter, and Sidney. Thank you. Safe journey home. And I repeat my thanks to Colin and to Lenny for being here tonight, for your contributions, and to thank all of you. And if you're interested in the work of my foundation, please take one of the leaflets here. Thank you.